Good afternoon, everyone. So um, we're just going to wait just a few more minutes because we can see the numbers increasing. So we'll give uh, just another one, two minutes before we get going. Thank you for joining. Okay, I think uh, we can start uh, with 100 people already here in the seminar. Um, a warm welcome to everyone joining us today. This webinar is the second in a series that we're running throughout the year, looking at different aspects of creating a mental health system and services that don't use coercive practices and that promote a rights-based recovery approach. Um, for those of you that were here for our last webinar, our first webinar, it painted a bigger picture of what coercion free services can look like in practice and how they operate. And uh, basically the purpose of today's webinar is to highlight the central role of de-escalation in addressing crises and avoiding coercive practices in such services. So the idea here is to really drill down to, into the practicalities of implementing de-escalation techniques that can make a tangible difference in how people experience and receive services and supports. Following this webinar, we're going to be exploring other complementary elements, strategies and interventions that need to work together in order to eliminate coercive practices, including recovery planning, supported decision-making and more. So um, you can refer to the chat now for a more complete lineup of what's to come. The webinar series has been run as part of the World Health Organization's Quality Rights Initiative. This is something that I'm leading uh, at the World Health Organization based in Geneva, and I didn't introduce myself, so I apologize for that. My name is Michelle Funk, and I have my uh, team members with us online uh, today. You may know that Natalie Drew was coordinating uh, the uh, webinar series and this one in particular, and you can see her online. Um, I encourage everyone participating today to complete the WHO Quality Rights e-training because this e-training provides the foundation for establishing the right mindset and understanding to put in place uh, these types of non-coercive services, strategies, interventions, and practices. And so if you go to the chat, you will see a direct link to the Quality Rights e-training. Please, we encourage you to do that training. You will also find other practical resources in the chat on the overall Quality Rights Initiative, our training resources and tools for ending coercive practices, as well as additional videos uh, on de-escalation tools and techniques, which we will be discussing today. Let me thank in advance our moderator and speakers for today's webinar. We hope you'll learn a lot from the discussions and dialogue. I'd like to now hand over to Dr. Ahmed Hankir, who will facilitate this webinar. Ahmed Hankir is a consultant psychiatrist in the UK and Canada, honorary visiting professor at the School of Medicine at Cardiff University and assistant Professor at the uh, Schulich uh, School of Medicine and Dentist Dentistry at Western University in Canada. Um, he identifies as a wounded healer and survivor and is passionate about rejecting mental health related stigma and empowering, dignifying and humanizing persons living with mental health conditions and psychosocial disabilities through the power of storytelling. He is a wonderful close colleague and friend. So I'm so pleased to have you here with us to facilitate this webinar. Ahmed, over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Funk, for that very kind introduction. Hello, marhaba, welcome to the WHO Quality Rights Training Webinar on Eliminating Coercive Practices in Mental Health Crisis De-Escalation practice and tools. We are absolutely delighted and thrilled that you can join us. It is my privilege and pleasure to facilitate this webinar today. Thank you so much, Dr. Funk, for the opportunity. 
Nowhere is coercion more apparent than in the chemical and physical restraint of persons in a mental health crisis. The stories and harrowing testimonies of persons who were restrained in such an inhumane manner bears witness to how brutalizing these mental health crisis de-escalation approaches can be. We are painfully aware of this and an innovative approach to mental health crisis de-escalation that honors the human rights of persons living with a mental health condition as opposed to violating them has been developed. Such an approach was co-designed, co-developed, and co-delivered by persons who have survived coercive practices in acute psychiatric settings. This webinar will start off with a description of the key concepts and interventions of crisis de-escalation by Jennifer Kilcoyne. Jennifer leads a national culture change program in health services across England. She is committed to improving the personal and clinical outcomes of mental health services through working in partnership with people with lived experience to reduce restrictive practice and promote rights-based compassionate care. Jennifer's talk will be followed by a brief discussion about the importance of persons with lived experience participating in de-escalation, including training, delivered by Gavin Harding, MBE. Gavin is a specialist of quality and senior learning disability and autism advisor with lived experience. He is interested in this area of work because he himself has lived experience of being in different services and inpatient settings. He has received some good care in the past, and he's also received bad practice, which includes the trauma of mechanical restraint, which has stayed with him and which he still thinks about a lot. To be clear, person, oh, sorry, can you silence your, can you, can you put your mic, uh, your, can, you, can you put your micro, uh, can you mute your microphone, please? I can hear some background noise. To be clear, we refuse to be silenced any longer. Persons living with a mental health condition have voices. We can speak for ourselves and we will be heard. We will then move on to the next part of the webinar, which consists of three videos, each of which contains a mental health crisis de-escalation scenario that we will collectively view. I will then provide insights and reflections in my capacity as both a provider and receiver of mental health care services. We will then invite the panel and the audience to comment and ask questions. The Q&A session is an interactive session and we invite you to participate. We will comment on what we think went well and ways that we can improve services. I will then wrap up this webinar and this will be followed by closing remarks from Dr. Michelle Funk. We invite you to stand in solidarity with persons living with a mental health condition and psychosocial disabilities to contribute to a cultural revolution that empowers, dignifies, and humanizes us. And so without further ado, I hand the microphone over to Dr. Sorry, to J Jennifer Kilcoyne, who will describe the key concepts and interventions of crisis de-escalation. Thank you very much, Ahmed. That's a um, very helpful introduction. So I've got um, just a short time, really, to give you a very brief overview of um, de-escalation skills. Um, but as I said, we can build on this in the uh, discussion of the videos later on. So de-escalation, what is it? It's a range of communication and management strategies to reduce high levels of frustration and stress and upset um, to prevent conflict um, and also to um, help the person to prevent them um, reacting in negative ways towards themselves or to other people. The aim is um, to increase safety and, and to avoid those coercive practices that you've just spoken about that are associated with trauma. And what de-escalation does is it helps the person to really regulate um, their arousal, to um, 
decrease their emotional um, activation and really address their concerns in a positive, uh, non-threatening way. It's important to remember that um, most emo emotionally based interpersonal conflict often relates to people's needs being not met. Um, it results in them feeling overwhelmed, distressed, frustrated, vulnerable and anxious. So what we need to be mindful of is that actually addressing their concerns is of primary importance. And of course, coming into hospital is can be for some people a very, very frightening and disempowering experience. And people often also living with mental health conditions who are neurodiverse or who have learning disabilities might have had significant lifetime traumas throughout their lives. So what we need to do is to make sure that we don't re, re, um, re traumatize them through making them feel powerless, punished, controlled or rejected. Um, so a critical step in, in de-escalation, the first critical step is, is prevention. And it's about creating services and organizing and designing organizational cultures that meet people's needs and that address their physical and psychological safety, that work in partnership with people that develop collaboration practices and that really support people to maintain their well-being. And what we know is our, thing, our programs such as um, reducing restrictive practice programs such as No Force First, Safe Wards, um, the HOPES program, um, those, are, those are kind of the, um, the programs that we've used in our service. They really design into them that high level leadership that supports people to be um, compassionate towards people, to develop good therapeutic relationships and to involve people in their care. So what we try to do is to um, make sure that we don't re-traumatize people, that we involve them in their care and that we listen and um, empower them to um, take part in a safety culture. You'll find in the chat there is also um, a more recent clinical trial called the Addition Trial that looks at organisational culture and how to be more collaborative with people in services. So it suggests things like involving um, people in services in staff handovers, making sure that they can choose um, the most appropriate treatment for themselves, making sure that you train staff in trauma sensitive approaches. So if prevention doesn't work and you're dealing with a situation, I'm just gonna go over some of the key principles that might be really helpful. The first is around early recognition. What we really need to do is to notice when people are becoming distressed at an early stage, because communication and problem solving is better when people's arousal is at a lower level. So what we, what we try to do then at those times is really get staff to support, intervene and support people at that particular point to try and address what the concern is. If the situation is escalating, what we want to do is to help manage the environment. So we want to remove external stressors such as interruptions, other people. Um, we want to kind of make sure that things like lighting and noise are kept to a minimum and encourage the person to move to a safe, quiet space so that they can have a conversation. It's really important that we create space. We don't want to overcloud the person and we also want to give them an the exit strategy so that if they, need, if they do feel unsafe, they can leave the situation without too much problem um, and go to compose themselves somewhere else or go to a place of safety. It's also important that staff, I think, need an exit strategy. So, because what we often find is actually, it's often staff's responses that can prevent good de-escalation. So when staff are feeling anxious or frustrated themselves, it's those responses that really get in the way of trying to support the person and help them to achieve a good outcome. So staff need to be mindful of their nonverbal and their verbal communication and try to remain calm, to remain composed and to kind of keep a calm tone. They also need to reflect on, are they the right person? Is there someone else who might be, have a better relationship with the person or 
create a connection with the person who might be able to de-escalate this situation more effectively. When engaging with the person um, who you are de-escalating, it's really important to show that high degree of empathy and compassion. Um, really actively listen to what their concerns are. Really give them the time and the space. People in services have said that's often one of the really key principles that actually people don't listen. They ignore what's being said or they rush what's being said or they jump in with what they think is the answer. So it's really important that you clarify the situation, that you are clear, find out and get a clear understanding of what you really need to do to support the person and to help them. Validate the person's feelings, don't dismiss them. And even if you don't agree with them, it's really important that you don't start challenging them or getting into an argument with them. What you want to show are some feelings of flexibility and compromise. So think, ask yourself, can I negotiate here? Is there something that I can do to be flexible? Or do I need even need to apologize because actually I've got something wrong and I've caused this situation in some way or our service has caused this situation. So treat the person with respect because actually at those times, people are very sensitive to feeling undermined. They're very sensitive to feeling vulnerable and ashamed and may have often these feelings that relate back to previous trauma. If you can redirect the person um, to a happier experience, so a time when you've shared or done something nice together or a happy experience that they had, this might help calm the situation down. It might help them to get more kind of emotional control. Um, and I often at those times use humour, but you do need to know the person quite well um, to use that humour. So sometimes, you know, it's sometimes helpful to kind of make fun of myself at that particular time or to kind of, um, you know, elicit a smile or a laugh um, before refocusing on the issue. Um, I think as well, we have to make sure that people realise that their concerns are really important to us as well as to them um, and avoid big words and jargon at that particular time. What we know is that when people are stressed, they're processing and they're understanding of the situation often goes down due to the kind of the hormones and the stress hormones that are going around in their mind. So what we need to do is that um, we need to kind of, you know, encourage calmness in that environment and take things slowly, give them time to process. There's also a lot of things about um, through de-escalation can be a really effective mechanism, not just for people who are neurodiverse, but for people with dementia. So things like music, massage, pressure, kind of, and sensory and comfort rooms are really helpful in terms of reducing people's arousal and distress levels when they are approaching crisis. Um, the sensory, um, what we have in the chat are talk down tips. And that's a kind of some work that Len Bowers did in Safe Boards. And what that does is it provides a very brief summary of those um, interventions that I've talked about. I think the other thing that we need to be mindful of are making sure that people's additional needs, whether they are visible or not visible, um, are recognised. We need to recognise the person's unique cultural context, the important things about their identity. Um, and their diverse attributes, because what we need to do is to understand what would make things better from them from their point of view. We need to make tailored communication strategies to them. So sometimes in services, the person might not even speak the same language as the staff. And it's really important that we either find someone who can communicate with them really well, or we get an interpreter because often the messages and the positive support is lost in translation. So we need to also understand what might be important to that person in terms of their unique cultural context or identity. So are there particular foods, activities, um, support from family, spiritual needs that might support the person when they're feeling so distressed and such in crisis? So that we can use those to try and um, make them feel more comforted and calm. 
So just to conclude, I think um, my take home message um, to all the teams that I have worked with and people that I support is usually that the important thing about de-escalation is what you're trying to establish is connection rather than control because that will result in positive outcomes for everyone. Wow. What a point to end on, Jennifer. Very powerful and very informative. Thank you so much. I'm going to invite, ask Gavin if he can give a brief talk about the importance of persons with a lived experience participating in de-escalation, including training. Gavin, over yeah. to you. My name's um, Gavin Harding. I work for NHS England as a senior learning disability advisor and employed full time in the United Kingdom. And I was the first person to be employed within NHS England. But um, the way people want to be spoken to when we when we're in segregation and things and seclusion is. We want to have staff who can talk to us like any other human being. And that's why if you treat us the way we kindly, like we treat you, then, then that's how we want to be spoken to. But we don't want to be spoken to like we're a piece of dirt off the someone talk down being spoken to horribly by people so when we're in when we're in the crisis yeah we might be panicking in the situation and having a and behaviors might be strange and that's because people are scared when they first go into a seclusion room and they don't know what's happening and when staff going to um, try and restrain someone, they do it straight away without explaining to people what will happen. And that's what you, staff need to do is talk, talk to the patient calmly and explain the situation why they're in the hospital. And that's the main thing that people need to do is treat us like human beings and nothing without us behind our backs as well. Because it's a scary moment for us to be in hospital if you're in there in the first time and you don't know what's happening. And if you're carried in by the police and then staff take over and restrain you, people are not gonna people are not gonna know what's happening. So what I'm saying is if you if we are in a situation, talk to us and calm us down instead of going straight in for it because that's the worst thing you can do because you're actually making the situation worse. Yeah, it is. And that's the worst thing you can do to a patient is actually make them worse where they actually then pull down the ceiling Yep, yeah. and actually, and we get into such a state that staff start piling in on the patient. Great, thank you, Gavin. That and the best way of doing getting us involved is actually doing what I did in the Hope Project, and that's getting involved in the interviews. Yep, yeah. and we actually, I actually went, so we actually. Me and Jennifer and Danny actually did the interviews in person, and then they also um, trained the practitioners in the host in the host project. And I'm also co-chair with Norman Lamb, but I have a full say on the hopes over the um, and help the staff and talk to the practitioners as well about ideas, or sometimes they come they came for advice what to do. But when I did the training, I actually did a scenario with them and then led the scenario and showed them how it was done. 
and took the lead on that over nurses. Yeah. Well, thank thank you, Gavin. Thank Sorry. You. Was there any other comments you wanted to make, Gavin? Sorry. No, I just want people to treat people as human beings and not be scared of them. And that's the thing. And not de escalate make it worse for people in hospital. Well, I, I must echo what you were saying and uh, emphasize the importance of what you were saying. And uh, you, your words are heartfelt. And at the moment, it seems, correct me if I'm mistaken, Gavin, at the moment, it seems it's everything about us without us. And it really should be nothing about us without us. Yeah, it is. That's what I meant. Yeah, sorry. No, 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 not at all. Not at all. That's what I understood. Not, that's what I understood. Yeah. So, so thank you for that, Gavin. So we're just going to go move to the uh, next part of the agenda now. So we have three brief videos that we will be playing. After each video, I will provide some insights and, and some reflections on my capacity as a wounded healer. And then the panel will make some uh, comments and then we'll open it up to the audience. And we, we really want this part to be interactive. It is only a 20 minute interactive Q&A session and um, we must be mindful of the time. And so um, I may interject and uh, redirect the uh, discussion um, because we do, as I said, to emphasize, need to be mindful of the, uh, of the time. So the first video is called, I just need five minutes. And I think, yes, we'll, just about to play it now. If you, um, please do mute your microphones, unless you are speaking, obviously. Hi, Jason. Hey, right. I'm, I'm good. How are you? Yeah, not too good today. Oh, I'm wow. feeling a bit stressed out. Really, not really good at all. Oh, what's the matter? I can't stop though. Because I've got to go to the meeting, so I'm in mean, a bit of a rush. No, I need to get some stuff off my chest. We just have a chat with me. Mm -hmm. Maybe no, when I come it. back, maybe when I come back. Jay, you always do this because you always catch me when I'm rushing off to somewhere. I will come back. Oh, this is important. I'll come back, Jay. I'll come no, back. No, you're not. I'll come back. I hear this all the time from people. No, don't just wander off. But then I can't no. miss a meeting, Jay. You know that. What's more important? Jay. Meetings or looking after people? Well, I'll come no, back and talk to you. No, come on. I will come back and talk to you. No, I, I need just to talk to me. I just stop giving five minutes. Give me five minutes. Babe, I always give you five minutes. I will come back and talk to you. This is just ridiculous. You know, waste the time. I don't know why you're I don't want to bother the sentence, okay? Okay, just give me five minutes. Let me let me talk to Danny and I'll come back to you, okay? I'll come back to you. I'm not putting up with this. Do you know what? Do you know what, Dave? I was just thinking about it, and I think I could have done things a little bit differently today. I'm really, really sorry. I need some help. Okay, let, let's sit down. Why don't we sit down? I'll, I'll ask someone else to go and do my meetings. Okay. I'll ask someone else to go and do my meetings because I think this is really important, isn't it? It's very important to me, really. Okay. Because I've, I've just been thinking about the way I reacted there. You know, I think that I sometimes stop it. I'm not being disturbed. 
not had the telly dog and, and, and other people interrupting me, other patients are coming in talking at me all the time. I just need a bit of quiet time, a bit of space away from everyone to, to work things through my head because I'm just getting completely stressed out and I don't want to take it on. I'm telling you, I feel this way, I've just taken it on. Well, do you know what I did? I thought, afternoon free now. So, how about we go to the garden? Yeah. And a bit of fresh air. Yeah, a good nice chat and a nice cup of tea, how about that? Oh, I'd, I'd love a cup of tea. I'm, I, I don't want to take the whole day on this. Don't worry, don't worry. this is what we need to do to try and help. So let's go get a cup of tea and go to the garden, and we'll see where that takes us. Oh, it'll definitely not be enough, it will help me. What about your meetings then? Oh, then we'll do that. I'm just glad to be out of here. Let me unmute myself. Uh, wow. I think, I think this video beautifully illustrates the importance of humanity and humility in mental health care. And I will say it, I think we need a lot more humility in uh, mental health care. The practitioner had the, hum had the humility to accept that she could have done things differently. And she apologized sincerely and unreservedly. That was the turning point. At that moment, there was a rapid de-escalation in the patient's presentation, and he himself apologizes for how he spoke to her. This is a very touching example of how when we listen empathetically to patients, treat them with dignity, and interact with them with kindness and respect, we can see the human to human connection, the, the authenticity of which is so powerful, it can help to heal the deepest of wounds. Can I invite our panel to share their insights and reflections on this video before opening it up to the audience? Gavin, do you want to go before me or after me? After you. Okay. Yeah, so I think that um yeah, very positive example of um de-escalation. Obviously, this is very relevant for um at the moment with um staffing shortages across services and people um often struggle to find the time to do what the what the real job is that is about caring and supporting people. Um they often have lots of demands and pressures that kind of kind of get in the way of things. So I think that um as you say, it was very positive practice that she recognised that, that she was able to kind of, you know, pass on some of the more administration tasks and actually meet the person um, and understand his distress and think about how she's going to distract him from that situation by going in the garden, having a cup of tea and thinking about what solutions and problem solving they can do together to help alleviate his distress. Um, and it was very clear in the in the video that that had a really positive effect on on both people. Okay. Great, thank thank you, Jennifer. Over over to you, Gavin. Well, I think it's humanity, but I disagree with Jennifer that staff shortages shouldn't default. We're a good delivering a good service, actually, from a patient point of view. They should still have the time because if you're good if you're good enough staff team, you'd be able to make that time and work together actually. So there's no excuse for staff shortages at all. But um I think that video actually showed where the nurse actually realized that she um had to change her attitude quite quickly. And I think that was a positive move. But I also think that the patient actually sat calmly there as well and actually went through the planning. That's how it should be. Whether there's staff shortages on the ward or not, staff should make time and make an effort to talk to the patients. I couldn't have put it any better myself. Gavin. And it's it's amazing how that time, even a few minutes, five minutes, can make such a positive difference. So we're going to open up to the audience now. Um, I, I, actually, I can see some comments on the chat. 
but what we'll do is if you if your cameras are off, please turn them on. And um, Natalie, I think we're going to select um, some people person. can perhaps raise their hands. Or raise, or raise they don't their hands. Yeah. yeah. So where is that? Uh, anyone want to make any comments, questions? Ask any questions, rather, sorry. Make any observations? Oh, yeah. Is that, let me have a look here. Uh, Car Carmen, yeah. Carmen, hello. Hi, colleagues. <laughs> Hope you can hear me. Uh, we can hear you, we can see you. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, maybe also because sometimes it's difficult for people to let them know that the hand is under the React section on the bottom. Um, and I just wanted to highlight, there's a colleague saying in the chat, and I think it's really important, Georgia is mentioning the, the staff shortages and how can the, that can create that tension environment where you're just so worried about not having time to react that, that that's the default answer is oh, busy. And I, and I think that's important to acknowledge and it's important to keep on fighting for services to, to be properly staffed and to have the time that patients require. But I think it's also, it doesn't invalidate the video in the sense that even if she couldn't have a state for, if, if she couldn't have canceled the entire meeting, that initial, yes, I can arrive five minutes late to my meeting. That is, that is already, I think that's what the video has the power is that this is the best case scenario where she actually is able to hand over the meeting to someone else. But even that initial, well, let me just send someone to say, I'll be 10 minutes late and listen to you right now, that could have also been uh, aligned with what she's doing. So I think it's a very powerful example. Um, and thank you for sharing it. No, oh, thank you. Thank you, Carmen. I think you make some very important points there. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it seems like she was initially being quite dismissive, wasn't she? And um, whereas when she reflected, she changed her approach and she was being perhaps more, more receptive. And I think it's that kind of initial reaction, you know, regardless of how much pressure i mean human beings don't get me wrong you know we're healthcare providers but we're still human beings um but regardless of how much pressure the the, the service is under it's it's that kind of that initial contact right and uh i guess how how we make persons feel and if they if they feel they're being fobbed off that's not very helpful um georgia hello um i can see your uh my 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 long my, my long key sorry i don't know if I'm, back. I'm so sorry if i pronounced that um incorrectly so I, as I wrote on the chat, uh, in Greece, uh, we are very understaffed. And as a patient, I was wondering whether uh, there also could be some training for the patients themselves in order to take care of each other. I think I'll ask. That's it. Gavin. That's all I wanted to say. Well, it's a very important question. And I, I'll invite Gavin to answer uh, that question Um if that's okay with you, Gavin, do you have any any thoughts on that about any training, not for providers of care, but for patients, for receivers of care, of care, if you like? Sorry, Gavin, you're muted. How do you mean by training for patients? Uh, actually, what I mean is uh, as a, the staff is trained, in order to um, uh, what to do in a crisis, maybe also patients could be trained what to do in a crisis in order to care for each other. Right, yeah, I'm just thinking about that because um, patients, yeah, there is some ways that patients could have training how to keep themselves calm but there's some patients who wouldn't be able to do that either but that's just modifying people would see that as patients modifying behavior but but i can see what you're saying is that some patients need to um have some training how to um, not get themselves in a crisis. Yeah. Yes, that's that's very helpful. Um, thank you, Gavin. Um, Jennifer, I can see that your um hand is raised. Yeah, I think that um 
So there, there is some um, evidence where people have trained, um, you know, other patients in terms of having a community to support people. So a lot of the reducing restrictive practice programs are based on having a, a ward community of people so that if people are feeling down or feel they need support, that, that it's not just staff that can offer that to them, it's other people in the service at that particular time as well. So um, that whole idea of having a ward community that supports the safety and supports the well-being of each other, whether that's the staff or whether that's the patients that actually, you know, you can kind of work in a reciprocal way to mutually support people as part of services. Where we and do of course, there's a lot of, oh, sorry. Where we do have is um, peer Peer support, support workers, peer yeah. Peer yeah peer support support workers. I can see peer, peer mentorship there as well. Yeah. 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 I'm just mindful uh, of the time. I'm just mindful of the time because we do, there uh, are, I can see um, multiple hands raised. Um, so, uh, Pascal Pereira, Pereira, if I can invite you to, to comment and to contribute. If you can unmute yourself, that's okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, sorry. I'm just saying, like, you know, this whole scenario is really good, showing a lot of positives. Uh, I come from a forensic background as well, and I have dealt with a lot of the escalation and everything. But the one good thing I've seen as well in it is empowering the patient, like asking the patient what would work for you. Yeah, that's... But the, on the other hand, as well, thinking of, like, what we mentioned about shortage of staff, which is really, like, you know, realistically, like, if you're working on a wall with only two, three staff, sometimes it can be very difficult to de-escalate. However, you know, in times when the ward is really quiet, is also sitting with the patient and, you know, like um, doing a care plan with them to see like, you know, when you start getting agitated, what can help, what can we do? And being, being honest with the patient, telling them like, you know, they are aware that we are short of staff. What are the things we could put in place in the meantime to support them when we are like busy on the ward? Can we get a, like, you know, a support worker? Maybe like in the UK, we have healthcare support workers who are trained and they can deal with the patients as well, giving them time until like, you know, either the name nurse or the doctors are free to see them. It's just being open and honest with patients because I've seen it work a lot with a lot of my patients in the escalation. Okay. That's really helpful, Pascal. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, yeah, the take home messages, I think, yeah, you know, of, of empowerment, of uh, collaboration, and of, of co creating these kind of de escalation plans when they are more settled. So, that, thank you. Thank you so much for saying that. Um, Celso Arango Lopez. Yes. Hi, hi everyone. Yeah. Um, and this is Celso from Madrid. I I, I I agree that uh, even it was a great video, especially you know the part of the humility and you know recognizing that things were uh, done wrong, and that I think is extremely uh, important. Uh, I was wondering if if you could have a, a version B of the video in which you know the the, the focus is not only on 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 the, the, the lack of time. I mean, I mean sometimes I think what was what, what was done wrong was uh, how the situation was managed, right? Yeah. And in terms of how it was said. But the reality is that sometimes it's completely impossible, right? I mean, I mean you're in an ER and there's someone waiting for you that it has even more emergency. So how to handle that situation when you truly do not have the time to do it? You know, asking for a junior colleague to help, uh, arrange uh, um, uh, an appointment later, late, because when you find the time to do it, it's always issued, right? But when there is truly not time to, um, you know, uh, address someone's uh, concerns and you have to handle it in a different way that postponing everything and sometimes that cannot be done. I guess, a, a, you know, video be with a, with less content of being able to sit with the patient, but how to handle it and in terms of, the, the, you know, the attitude, what is said, how it is said, uh, that will also be helpful. Yes, that's, right. yeah, that, that's that's incredibly important, and I think you know we need to be realistic, right? Um, what's happening in the um, in the real world? I mean, I guess in my capacity as a psychiatrist um, in 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 London, in England, and you know I haven't been in that situation. I, I would be extremely apologetic, um, and I would make a promise, and I would fulfill that promise. I and I would give them you know a specific time. It's like, look, I I'm so sorry. If I could, I would, but I can't. I'm so sorry. But what I can do is I can make this promise to you that I will come back at this time and we will talk about this. I promise you that. Um, and I, you know, and I, obviously it's important to fulfill that promise. So that's, I guess, that's how I would um, try to uh, approach the, the the scenario. 
Um, moving to, on to, I can see Wendy Hill. I see that your hand is raised. Hi. Um, yeah, I, I, I work in an acute general hospital as a mental health lead nurse and um, I do a lot of training with staff around this and, and generally the message I try and get across to people is that, yes, we're all short staffed and everyone's busy. However, if we just continue to take that sort of um, short, it seems a bit short sighted to me because sometimes investing a few minutes of time so that person feels heard can reduce the chances of that escalating to something much bigger that takes up a lot more time and a lot more staffing resources. So I, I just think, it, you know, it's, it's, it's trying to get that message across that, yeah, investing now can not only make that patient feel like they've been heard and that they matter, but also reduces the chances of it, it just becoming massive. That was all. That, 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 that's really, oh, yeah, that's um, very, agree. oh, sorry, Gavin, yeah, please, what are your thoughts on that, please? I Gavin. absolutely agree with you, Wendy, and, and short staff shouldn't modify um, where a world has um, got bad practices either, and that's where the management need to invest in people coming through the service and making sure that they're also buying in services like advocacy and peer advocacy for people so that people have to talk to on the wards. But short staff is a bit, it is short-sighted and, and people get so hung up on it they forget about the patients in the end. Mm. It's, it's very impactful. Um, thank you, Kevin. Thank, thank you, Wendy. You know, like that, that feeling of not being heard and how invalidating uh, that can be. And it doesn't take a lot of time. It even just takes a moment. Just you don't want to. Uh, I, I said this before. Don't, don't make the patient feel like they're being fobbed off. Um, it's, 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 it's a horrible feeling. And yeah, that, that. I mean, and that will, that will escalate. And they'll remember that. They don't forget that as well. So yeah, I mean, it's, it doesn't take a lot of uh, effort and time to make a person feel heard. Um, Dr. Loveness, did I, yep, I see that your hand is raised. I'm sorry, I can't, yep, you're on mute. Can you hear me? Yep, yep you've unmuted, hello. Um, uh, thank you very much for, for this. Um, you're welcome. My question is in connection with, um, from a clinical perspective, when we are dealing with the escalation and there is a component of lack of insight, um, the, the patient actually feels they are doing the right thing. Um, in our setting, we have situations where the patient is very violent, destroying property, coming home, screaming, waxing and waning. And then you want to, um, um, manage through de-escalation, but the patient has got no insight. I would have loved a situation where we could also take a diversional approach to managing a de-escalation in the setting of lack of insight and and uh, excessive psychomotor agitation. That's that's incredibly important. I think it was mentioned earlier on that when the patient is more settled, might that be an opportunity? to co-create a plan for when they are more unsettled or when their presentation does escalate, how would how would they like for the, their mental health care team to assist and to intervene? I'm just mindful of the time. Uh, we have to move on to the uh, next video. So uh, Natalie, are you able to play the next video for us? I can do that, yeah. Fantastic. Sorry, I'm not able to answer any of the questions, just kind of mindful of the time. Uh, constraints. A good de-escalation involves empathetic listening, intervening in a calm way, to make sure people feel that this is a safe environment, that we're here to help and not to hurt. You aren't crowding them, you're not glaring at them, but you're looking like you're receptive and helpful. Smith. Oh, Mr. Hi. Smith. Hi. There is a certain way that we'd like to approach. Arms are going to be at your side. Your hands are typically outwards. You're relaxed. Your knees are maybe bent just a little bit so you look at ease. 
you're there safe and open and welcoming. I had a, a little bit over two arm lengths of space between me and our patient. He had what we call a line of egress, a way that he could escape, which we didn't want him to follow, but he could see it and that would help him to relax nonetheless. No, I'm we... seeing all these people here and they're scary. Sometimes when people are agitated, their thoughts are kind of racing in their head. They're not hearing things the first time so clearly. We use these short phrases and repeat them until they really start to sink in. Everybody here is in a different situation, but this is a safe place. We're here to help. We don't hurt people, we help people. Then why did the police come? I think out of all the things, what I really like to ask people is, is what, what can we do to help you? What do you need right now? What, 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 tell us what would make things better. Many, many times I've talked to uh, individuals who've uh, just undergone a psychiatric uh, agitation crisis and they'll say, nobody would listen to me. Everything would have been so much better if, if, if somebody just would have listened. Let's talk about you. What can we do right now to help you feel better? I'm in a psychiatric hospital. Yeah. My brother put me in a psychiatric hospital. It's a safe place. It's a safe place. It is a safe place and we're here to help. Uh -huh. So would uh, you like something to eat maybe, something to drink? Would that help? Maybe going you. somewhere where we're a little bit away from all this, the rest of the crowd, we can sit down and talk and you can have something to eat. Probably the most important thing is helping people to calm down and regain control on their own with a little bit of help from us. One of the ways you regain control is if you feel you have your own ability to make decisions and so offering people choices gives them the chance to choose and gives them a little bit more of a say in what's going on around them and that in and of itself can help people to relax. Maybe they want to go to a room and lie down, uh, maybe with the, with the lights dimmed a bit. Um, sometimes people want to listen to music. Um, maybe just getting away from a stressful situation somewhere in the emergency room, getting them to a different part of the emergency room can be enough. Maybe going you. somewhere where we're a little bit away from all this, the rest of the crowd, we can sit down and talk and you can have something to eat. I am hungry. I haven't eaten for 12 hours because it's stupid cops. They kept me against my will and that's illegal. I've never so been in a place like this. Look if you've never you. been somewhere like this before, it can look a little strange and unusual. Look at those people but over like there. Like I said, it's safe, and this is a place where we help people, and we want to help you. How about we get you something to eat? You and I can go and sit and talk while you have something to eat. Would that I'd help? I'd really rather just have, just do the, what you need to do to get mm -hmm. me out of here. Okay. We can talk all about how we can get you out of here, but first we need to sit down and have a chat. Get you a little something to eat, sit down, and we can talk this place. Okay. Well, okay. Come with me. me. We'll go get something brother. to eat and we'll go sit down. All right. Just, All right. I don't, just stay close. Okay? Just stay, okay. Don't be close to me. They say it would be faster just to put somebody in restraints and give them a shot. But if you think about it, when we talk about verbal de-escalation, we're usually saying just a few minutes, maybe three, four, five minutes. That should be all you really need. Uh, and when you're only talking about five minutes and helping somebody uh, compassionately to get better and to, and to relax and calm down, um, that much easier to do uh, restraining and, and uh, giving medications actually doesn't, uh, isn't faster at all. But it's going to take a few minutes. We need to talk about why you're here. If you're going to put somebody in restraints, first you have to get a big group of people together, make a move on an individual, take them down. A nurse is going and getting medications and then coming back and need staff again so that they can hold somebody down to give them the injection. It's 20 or 30 minutes that you're doing because that was quicker than the five minutes of de-escalation. It really doesn't make a whole lot of sense when you look at it that way. The other thing about it is, is that we found out that the vast majority of assaults from patients to staff occur during that tackling an agitated person to take them down and put them into restraints. It's really a win-win to try to do de-escalation and intervene in this compassionate, collaborative way as opposed to the old-fashioned restrain and sedate. What's been really, really amazing is that uh, when one hospital is getting really good and they start having these great outcomes and the word gets around and then other hospitals want to pick up on it and pretty soon all the hospitals in a district or a region are doing it. And everywhere we keep hearing about it, we keep hearing the same great things where staff are getting really proud of what they're doing and they really feel like they're, they're uh, being healthcare providers rather than 
jailers, if you will. Having a different way to do things has been, uh, I think, so exciting. And when you do see that sea change in staff, they get excited and they want to tell everybody else about it and the word continues to spread. Right. Um, thank you, Natalie, for playing that. So, I mean, I think I think for me, the uh, the most important take on message is never, I repeat, never administer tranquilizers because it would be faster. That is unconscionable. It might only be a momentary clinical encounter for you, but for the patient, they will live with the trauma of chemical restraint for the rest of their lives. Now, um, I'm going to open the floor to the audience um, first. So um, I think, is that uh, Claudina, you've, your hand has been raised for, for a while now. Is that for this video or for the previous video? Okay. Um, I <clears throat> Thank you so much. Fantastic. I don't know. Can you hear me? We can hear you and we can see you. Oh, great. Okay. So, um, so the name is Claudina and, and I work with the Pan American Health Organization. I'm stationed in Washington. This has been beautiful. I absolutely, I, I'm, I'm passionate about this work. I'm a psychiatrist, but I wanted to comment and I won't take too long. In the first video, one of the things I, I look at is that the, at no point there was no offer of medication, which is great. But then the gender issues, because when the nurse called the at her colleague, it was a sorry. man. I, I am so sorry, Claudina. Is this is it for this current video or the, or the previous? Yeah, one? I'm going. I'm going to my points. So okay, I, because normally we don't pay attention to that. This was a nurse, a female nurse, who handled it quite well. And sometimes, in occasion, people will think that if you have a man, then it will be easier. So I wanted to come. No, we I'm didn't trying make to balance between what obviously like, he wants mm -hmm. versus second, like second what he wants the expectations sorry, from sorry, the somebody organizers. Has their, somebody has a microphone. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, if you if you could mute your microphones if you're not speaking, please, because it is very disruptive. Sorry, uh, please go on, uh, Claudina. You're oh, and you're I, I, yeah, yeah, thanks. Thank you, thank you. I just wanted to, because I think it's always important to keep that, you know, in terms of the gender issues. Because oh, yeah. the second video, the first video was very clear. You, I would have thought, oh, she's calling her colleague and then, you know, because she stayed. And this second video, I love it too, because then now you have a video of the two men and then how they interact. But at no point, even doing uh, what I like about the videos is the fact that you're giving choices to the person. It's not about you telling them what you think will be good for them. And I think yeah. this is the beauty of that. So thank you. But the two issues were the issue of medication, which is normally people quickly jump into, thinking yeah. it's which is not. And also I think it's issue that we have a, conf we talk about the issue, this issue of gender. Most psychiatric hospitals will tell you, we want man power, we want, you know, yeah. and you see how the issue can be handled very well by women. Absolutely. And, and I think you make some incredibly important uh, points, uh, Claudina. Um, so I, I should add that for this video, I, I think there are examples of things that went well and things that didn't go so well, or or the, the acronym that I like to use is what went well and uh, EBI, even, even better if. So um, anyone else uh, have any uh, comments, uh, reflections, uh, insights, questions um, in relation to that specific video? Anyone else have their hand raised um, before we invite our panel members to? Doesn't look like anyone else has their hand raised. Um, Gavin, Jennifer, um, any any thoughts, oh, any reflections? Course. Gavin, yeah. Um, I agree. No one should um, be putting needles in anyone because it is illegal in this country now on how they about um, actually going at a patient without even telling them and it and it's actually um, some doctors can be prosecuting and arrested now for doing that in this country and in the especially in England and um I felt the video was too medical model, to be honest, mm. and it wasn't um, a great way of practice. Okay. Well, no, thank you for your uh, views, uh, Gavin. V very important. Um, uh, Jennifer, I mean, things that were good and you think things that could have been better, maybe? Um... 
Yeah, so I think that <clears throat> some things were good. He was very open, he was very calm, he was very kind of reassuring in his approach to the person. He provided a bit of a context. He offered food, which the person, you know, had said they hadn't eaten for 12 hours, which can affect how stressed people feel and how angry they feel as well. Um, so I think they they were positive. I think um, as you pointed out, you know, the kind of the weighing up of the situation um has been that actually, you know, it may only take, um, you know, a couple of minutes to de-escalate someone. But actually, even if it takes quite a while to de-escalate someone, if you're avoiding that trauma that they're going to live with for the rest of their life, that's going to affect their recovery, it's really important that you put some time and effort into doing that. Yeah. Um, and I think the other thing it highlights is the the importance of having, if having reducing restricted practice programs where you have strong leaders who are valuing the approach, valuing compassion towards, um, you know, people on wards, valuing providing, trying to release time for people to care, valuing that actually, you know, um, organisations should be designed around meeting the person's needs rather than the organisation's needs, and also making sure that they're co-designed. And that's what a lot of the uh, reducing restrictive practice programmes do, and they have very um significant results so for example in our organization we were able to reduce assaults um, um harmful behaviors to staff by over 46 percent when we really focused on having that um program and um, some of the other things are around you know making sure that you know you don't have lots of rules that kind of serve the staff group rather than and but actually just really infringe on people's rights so um and i think you know being mindful of things like you know clinical meetings and assessments that they're very anxiety provoking for the person so you need to do a lot of work proactively to kind of build up to that so um i think that yeah those are things that you know i, th I thought in relation to the video no thank you for thank you for uh, vocalizing your thoughts um jennifer um i'm mindful of the time i think we are overrunning um so we'll play the next video and uh, natalie should we um should we do that, shall we? Yeah, sure. Great. So this Great. is the last. Can this I, is the last. Sorry. Can I just? I just saw one hand. It was Alison. Let's oh. let Alison yeah. because there was oh, only one person to speak, and we have I can't a see bit hand. of time. We've got still okay. got six minutes. Okay. Okay. But okay. no. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor Funk, for intervening. Alison, I can't. I don't think I can see you. I, I'm sorry. I can't turn on my video, but I oh, just want to. My name is Alison. I work with WHO um, and support a lot of particularly low resource settings. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say how encouraged I am by both of these videos that the threat of seclusion or restraint is not being used. So mm -hmm. I still hear people attempting de-escalation by using the threat of um chemical or, or mechanical um, restraint or seclusion. And I, I guess I just want to emphasise that that could actually create a higher escalation. So I'm pleased that none of these videos are reflecting any of that. I, I think that's, thank you so much for saying that, um, because the threat of coercion is coercive. Um, and, you know, we need to be clear, we need right. to be clear about that. So um, yeah, no, incredibly, incredibly important point. Um, well, I think yeah, we still actually have a few minutes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Funk, for pointing that out. So um, any other uh, comments or maybe I think we have time for maybe one one quick question. Um, if anyone has any um, comments, questions. Otherwise, if we don't, then yeah, shall we, shall we play the next video, the last video, um, Natalie? Yeah, I'll go ahead and set it up. Someone's been in my bedroom cupboard and I know who it was and they took it. I want a doctor. What's the matter, Ben? I've just been on, been on leave seeing my mum, haven't I, right? And I come back and I've gone to my wardrobe and, and, and my phone's been nicked and I know he's taken it. I know he has. Okay, you're going a bit too fast for me, Ben. Why don't you sit down and take a seat? I don't want to sit down. I want him to give me my phone back. He's, he's taking it to wind me up. Who took it? Philip! Philip! How do you know he took it? Have you got any proof? I know what he's like. He's always nicking stuff and I'm going to fucking do him. He Did took you it. see him take it? Did you see 
see him go anywhere near your cupboard. I've been with my mum, mum and I. Hey, I mean, he had three hours. That's when he must have done it. Well, did any of the other patients see him take it? I think we should ask first of all, don't you? I, I, I don't know. Have you looked anywhere else apart from your cupboard? Look, he took it. I know he has, and I want him to give it back. And if he doesn't give it back, I'm going to do him, and I'm going to smash his place up. Well, let's just ask the other patients first to see if anyone's seen it. No, did fucking you take way. it home? I know he, he... Let me finish. I was about to say, did you take it home with you? I didn't take it out. Look, Ben, you're most probably upset because your leave's over. Lots of people... No, fucking not. Philip's got my fucking phone. But you don't know that, do don't you? Don't tell me what I fucking know and what That's I don't. That's not what I'm trying to say. Yeah, what are you trying to say then exactly? Look, I'm just... Don't touch me! Look, calm down No, you me. calm down. Oh, this is ridiculous. What? That I've had my mobile stolen. You think I'm lying? Is that it? Is it? Someone's been in my bedroom cupboard, right? And I know it was, and they took it, and I want to get, I want to see a doctor. What's the matter, Ben? I've just been on leave seeing my mum, haven't I? And I've just come back, I went straight to my cupboard, right? And someone has taken my mobile. He's been in there, and he's taken my mobile. I know he has. So who took it, Ben? But Philip, Philip. Did you see him take it, Ben? Well, how could I? I was on leave, wasn't I? Of course, of course. Uh, what sort of mobile was it? Um, it's um, a Nokia, and it's got a camera. I only just got it. A Nokia? You must be really angry, right? Yeah, well, I didn't want to come back anyway, right? But I do, and I see him as always nip my mobile, right? And I've had it up to fucking here. Yeah, I can imagine. Listen, um, why don't we find somewhere to sit down and we can work out how best to get your mobile back, yeah? Well, yeah, but we can't just sit down. We've got to go talk to Philip. Why don't you come with me? We'll find somewhere quiet to sit down and talk no, about but, your mobile. No, we've got to go back. We've got to go and talk to Philip and look in his cupboard. Man, He's nicked it. That's the best thing. But I'm, I'm just I didn't taking want him to the quiet room. We need to go and talk to Philip. Let's have a seat, Ben. I don't want to see. I don't want to see. Okay, Ben, I'm going to sit down. Are you going to join me? <laughs> we won't be interrupted here. So tell me what happened. Well, it's like I said, right? I'm on leave and I'm seeing my mum and then I come back here and I go in my cupboard and my mobile's got and, right? And everything else has been like trash. I mean, for fuck's sake, you do not muck about with other people's cupboards. It's just wrong. Quite right, Ben. Your cupboard is yours and yours alone. <laughs> Listen. This might sound like a stupid question, but I've got to ask it. Well, Are you definitely sure you left your mobile in the cupboard? Yeah, I don't take it out in case I lose it. Okay, okay. And you were saying you thought that Philip took it? Yeah, yeah, to wind me up. He's always winding me up. What made you think it was Philip? Because I know what he's like. Okay, have you spoken to him? No, no, I couldn't find him. Okay, we can speak to him later. Did you need your phone now for a particular reason? Um, Did you need to call someone? Um, no. But my mum might have texted me. Right. So we need to get your phone back as soon as possible, don't we? Yeah. Do you want to call your mum? You can use the phone here. Um, no. Nah. Okay. So how long were you on leave for? Um, uh, three hours. And was it just with your mum? Yeah. So what did you do? Um, we went for something to eat. Okay. And what did you have to eat? What was that? Um, I had, um, steak pie and chips, and then I had, um, chocolate brownie. Was it good? Yeah, yeah, it was. It was really good, yeah. So you had a good time then, did you? Yeah, but it's only three hours, isn't it? Do you wish you had longer? <laughs> yeah, of course. So how do you feel about being back here now, then? <laughs> Pissed off. I can imagine. Lots of people find it quite hard coming back here after they've been on leave. Yeah. But well, what about my phone, though? Good point. I tell you what, I don't know if it's right to confront Philip yet until we've had a good look for your phone. Do you agree? I bet he done it. We'll do our best to find your phone for you. First of all, let's double check and make sure it's not hidden somewhere. Is that a good plan? I suppose so, yeah. Well, where do you suggest that we look first? Um, I could take you to my cupboard. That's a great idea. Yeah. So what were you wearing when you went out with your mum? Did you have your coat on? Uh, yeah, my black coat. Um, yeah. Uh, it'd be great if it's in your coat, eh? Yeah, it's not going to be there. So, <laughs> I'll just say it. Uh, this is my this is my favourite uh, video. I think in take two of the scenario, 
the the practitioner was i mean his empathy was palpable and and he validated the reason the patient was was angry and uh i think also what's remarkable is that when the practitioner was being criticized he wasn't being defensive he was being receptive and his tone was very soothing and he also explicitly commented on the human rights of the patient and how the patient's privacy should be protected and the importance of this. And he spoke about the things that mattered to the patient and de-escalation ensued and they co-created a, uh, a plan to locate the phone, which is one of the reasons why uh, the patient was so, was so upset. And again, the, the video illustrates that uh, de-escalation can occur without the need for chemical restraint. All that was needed was for someone to treat him like a human being. So I'll open the floor to uh, the audience if you have any uh, questions, uh, comments, uh, reflections, um, please do raise your hand. Can't see any hands at the moment. No. Um, can I ask uh, Jennifer, Gavin? I can see some messages. So in the meantime, if uh, Jennifer um, yeah. and or Gavin have any comments they would like to make, and I'll read some of these messages. Okay, yeah. So just obviously in the first instance, the person was very authoritarian. They kind of use very um, aggressive uh, signaling in their, in their nonverbal communication as well. Um, particularly they got drawn into a bit of a kind of a argumentative uh, interaction with the person and um, that led to a very clear escalation of the situation. Um, right from the very beginning, they were very uh, dismissive and they were very interrogatory in nature towards the person. So um, that obviously contributed to the person feeling un unheard and perhaps triggered them in terms of their behaviour. Um, and I think you've reflected perfectly well on the on the second one where the person would use really good um, de-escalation, offered a quiet space, offered some kind of reflection on something more positive to kind of get the person unstuck from that issue um, and then followed it up with co-designing a plan, which I think went really well. Fantastic. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, Gavin, any uh, any thoughts? thought um, that the person was, at first it was disruptive and then he managed to calm him down, which should happen without having to restrain somebody actually. And I felt that um, he was kind and, pink and talkative and talked the person down. And that's what should happen in most cases instead of someone charging in like a bull mm -hmm. and just going in there and making the situations worse. But also, I think the important message is, not just from this video, but it's the people who have no verbal communication, how people communicate, because they're the ones who get distressed when people can't communicate with them. And the and they're not and they're not learning how their communic forms of communication is, and that's when situations even get worse when people can't f communicate with them properly or know what they're like and what the and how to put communication things in front of them or put the favorite things or speak to the family carer. How to how to communicate with that person, and that's Absolutely. important as well. That they include the family carers in people's mm. lives as well. But sometimes a patient might not want the family involved, so they might need want a friend or something like that. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with you, Gavin. No, thank thank you for thank you for making those comments, uh, especially about the. Uh, the caregiver, um, I think that can they can be the most helpful persons and the most effective persons um, when it comes to uh, de-escalation, if you like. 
Um, I, I can't see any raised hands. There are some, uh, I think, some comments uh, on the chat. Michelle, Michelle has her raised hand. Oh, just yeah. Michelle, where, oh, Dr. Funk, is that Michelle? It is. Oh, yeah, oh, <laughs> ask, ask away, Dr. Funk. I, I suppose I just wanted to react to this. I, I love this video because, you know, in the first scenario, you see it. it is quite a typical response of, of, of how a lot of people would respond and react because the um, service, the person using the service was quite aggressive and quite emotional. So I think um, an immediate reaction of someone who is not trained and who really doesn't understand the skills would be to react like he did, like the staff member react, because you've got to resist being a little bit regressed and a lot of emotion being poured onto you. So I think actually for an untrained person, the way this person responded was is actually how most people would respond if you yeah. if you're not typical. trained. It is a typical response, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So and then the other thing that struck me with the video is just how, as someone observing the scenario, how your emotions change. So my emotion towards the staff member was really like, hey, stop this, you know, it was very negative. But in the second scenario, when he was behaving in a, a very different kind, um, validating way, uh, you had really such a warmth towards this person. And it's just interesting as someone who's observing this interaction, how you then respond to the different actors and the positions that they're taking. I just wanted to make those comments. Mm, mm, absolutely. No, and you feel, I felt the activation. I felt the kind of, what you know, the, the emotional activation um, in, in the second take, if you like. Um, so yeah, I can see a few more comments on the chat. Um, I'm just, just going to read it. Um, Ahmed, just we have Carmen and we had Mortimer, but he seems to have left. But Carmen is. Carmen uh, have a, a, a hand raised. Yes, please, Carmen, ask away. Yes. Um, I just wanted to know, mention something that I, I know as well. Yes. Um, related to the the training that probably requires requires everybody to be in the same page. So I noticed something that happens when the person, the main person talking uh, to, to this person in distress notes signals very quickly with just a look to his colleague, it's all good. We're just going to walk to the room. That means that the other person is also very aware of these type, types of techniques and then everything can flow because if but one, while you're trying to do your de-escalation, someone comes from behind with this kind of like threatening presence, then everything goes to pieces. So just pointing on teamwork and entire systems changes that is necessary for these things to work well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, we all need to be on the same page, right? Um, great. Ahmed, we have uh, Georgia and then Angelica. Right. And I think we'll just take those two more questions. And, then and Mort that... Mortimer has come back. Oh, what, OK. We have time for two, three questions. I think if people keep it very short, yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Was, it, was it Georgia? Are you up next, Georgia? Okay, uh, I will keep it short. I, I'm i wondering whether we are a bit of romantics when we're saying that no coercion should never be uh, used. And I'm referring to some cases when uh, as someone uh, during a crisis is transported to the hospital by the police, escalating the crisis, and then uh, most the, the usual thing to do is to get him in a safe room or inject him with uh, medication. Uh, I'm also talking from a patient uh, uh, view because uh, uh, maybe other patients are in danger. If uh, in such a crisis uh, uh, a patient comes into the hospital, just that. Mm -hmm. um... Wow. Yeah, no, I think it's an important question to ask um, because, I mean, there are some persons who want coercion to be eliminated altogether and there are other persons who are ad advocating for it to be reduced. Um, Jennifer, any any uh, response to that question or is it realistic or, uh, or romantic, as Georgia um, said? Um, I think that we need to put a lot of effort into making designing our services so that conflict um, reduces. We need to 
you know, we've um, worked in high secure services and my colleague Danny has taken people who have been transferred in highly restrictive uh, situations from uh, the prison service where they've been uh, moved by kind of like a riot team um, and has been very compassionate towards them, communicated that they're in a different space, communicated that this is hospital and people are going to uh, treat them differently. And, and that has had really positive, long lasting outcomes for that person. So I think it's about making sure our services don't assume that because someone, the police has brought someone that, and that they're in a highly frightened and distressed state that they need to be coerced initially. I think that you really need to make sure that you uh, do, um, you know, work with the person, try to understand their distress. We have done another video where someone is transported by the police um, in a very distressed state. And we I think we're going to share that as part of the chat as well. Um, and someone does de-escalate that person as well without the use of um, coercion and force. Can I, can so I think that it is possible. Yeah. And I think that, you know, our programme where it was around um, no force first is that actually there are lots of things that you can do before you would ever resort to coercion. Lots and lots of things that you want to try. Yeah. Gavin, did you want to come in? The, about the police? Because, well, we've got to realise is the police don't have not training on people with mental health issues and and at the moment they're saying they can't cope in this country in the united kingdom at the moment dealing with mental health issues and the dirt classes that is the priority going out especially mm -hmm. when someone's in um in a hospital setting they won't come out to support staff but if someone's in the community where they, they won't come out unless it's absolutely serious now in this country. And I think it's also because the lack of training that all these services have about people with mental health issues and how to do the escalating. Yeah. But you need the right kind of people to do that in the police forces and other forces mm -hmm. as well. And we have worked with the police to, and we have, we, in our service, we have um, mental health people who go out with the police to try and support them to be, because uh, obviously it's very frightening if you're kind of restrained by the police and kind of manhandled into hospital as well. So um, we have got some programs of work. We've done some training with quite a few other people where we've looked at how you might manage that situation if someone's very distressed or experiencing um, lots of mental health symptoms and they're brought into hospital about the sorts of things that you can do to um, alleviate their distress and de-escalate the situation without the use of coercion. A couple of years ago, what I did was, because the police crime commissioner um, in North Yorkshire at the time, Judy McMulligan and I had a meeting and we actually came up with a plan that we actually, um, and they actually did it. They actually put a mental health nurse and a learning disability nurse in the police control room. So when the call came through that someone was distressed, they was able to talk to them on the, on the police officer's radio and did that and came mm -hmm. out and Sometimes the community team came out, and that was across North Yorkshire, and they were the first county to do it in the country. Great. No, thank, thank you, thank you for sharing that with us, Gavin. Um, actually, guys, uh, Ahmed, yes. Sorry, go ahead. No, we just have we have one more question from Angelica. Think, yeah, I think we have time for one more question. Yeah, because it's and uh, Mortimer has lowered his hand. Yeah. Okay. So, Ange Angelica. Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, just a quick question comment to say no matter how how much people are trained on uh, you know having empathy and not being afraid of people um, with uh, psychotic issues you find there's a lot uh, there's still a lot of myths where people think that people with psychosis are dangerous or they are violent and therefore the moment someone starts showing aggression you find that people just rush to find ways of protecting themselves instead of trying to communicate uh, with the patient i don't know how this can be um how people can actually be taught that no 
they are not dangerous. And uh, well, it's not always the case that they are not dangerous, but to first of all, try and apply, you know, empathetic moves so that at least uh, the patient, um, you know, um, also gets out of the whole situation in a better way. Okay, yeah, uh, no, thank you. Thank you for that comment and that question. And Jennifer, I can see that your hand is raised. Uh, you have a response? Oh, you're muted, Jennifer, sorry. Sorry, um, in the chat, there is um, the addition clinical trial. And what they have done is they have uh, looked at a whole range of training clinically and evaluated it about how you can do that, how you can kind of change people's attitudes and their motivations to engage more in de-escalation. And they looked at kind of risk management cultures. They've looked at how you might address that. They've looked at how you might get senior leaders to support staff and reward staff for kind of having a compassionate approach to people. Um, and they've looked at a whole range of how you might co-design services so that, um, you know, incidents of conflict are much less likely to um, occur. So, so things like having an open door policy on the ward office, for example, so that people can kind of come and get reassurance and support and information whenever they need. So if you look through that, it's quite a long document, but there are lots of great ideas about how you might implement um, training for staff to improve that. Because what we know is that the more you teach staff about people's vulnerability, about what it's like to listen to, you know, have experienced voices, what it's like to, you know, have difficulties with your communication, um, we find that they have more empathy and are more likely to engage in less coercive approaches. Great. And I think that is the perfect end, perfect note to end on. Um, so thank you, everyone, uh, for participating, for contributing to the audience, to the uh, panel members. Um, so I'm just wrapping up now. Um, we've We've seen three different videos with scenarios about mental health crisis de-escalation. But I mean, the common denominator or the common theme, if you like, um, is that we can effectively de-escalate without the need for coercive interventions. And it's treating persons living with a mental health condition with, with dignity and respect. And that can't be emphasized enough. And we can't remind ourselves of that enough. And uh, persons living with a mental health condition must be involved in the design, development, and delivery of mental health care services, such as mental health uh, crisis de-escalation, at all levels. That's bottom-up and uh, top-down. And uh, who quality rights uh, embraces uh, the, uh, the human rights of persons living with a mental health condition, and uh, this webinar was part of the Who Quality Rights uh, series. So I will hand the microphone over to uh, Dr. Funk. Dr. Funk, over to you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, well, um, a big thank you to you, Ahmed, Jennifer, Gavin, um, everyone who's participated in this webinar and provided your comments, questions, um, you know, your ideas. I, I saw so many comments also in the chat and I'm that that would have generated um, more hours and days of discussion um, and enriched again, you know, the training even more. So it's only 90 minutes and unfortunately we couldn't respond to everything, but I think it gives you some good solid grounding and information on what, you know, can be achieved through de-escalation, not on its own, but as part of a more comprehensive <clears throat> approach, um, prevention, how the services are organized, and there are many other techniques as well to, to you know, make sure that we can develop services that are respecting rights and that are coercion free. Um, so what we do hope to do, you know, it's going to take time, it takes resources. We'd, We'd love to see this webinar be expanded into uh, a five day training uh, workshop and definitely we'll be working towards um, doing that. 
Um, but I'm just grateful that we had this opportunity for 90 minutes and such a great participation in this um, webinar. That's really exciting. So let me just remind you that we've put all the resources in the chat, a lot of um, videos in the chat, many of which uh, Jennifer and Gavin and the team have provided. So thank you so much because actually filmed uh, many different scenarios, which are going to be very helpful for this webinar, but obviously in 90 minutes we couldn't show any more. We're already at the end. Um, and yeah, so lots of resources, do the e-training um, and yeah, just go into more depth than what, what if you have the, the possibility and what we've provided. Also, please mark your calendars for the next training webinar. It's on recovery planning. Um, so a very different approach, moving away from the medical approach, we're moving towards the recovery approach. And if we can make that the central part of our interaction, you know, the, the recovery approach, what is going to help people get better in their minds. And, you know, that's another important part of the picture. So the, the training webinar, webinar on recovery planning is scheduled for the 23rd of May from, uh, three well 1530 to 1700 cest we can just pop that in the chat um but we will be sending out some communication to everyone who's joined this seminar as well as um through some social media so uh thank you everyone for your participation for joining us and until the next time take care goodbye see you soon bye everyone bye